<laughs> well, that should bring all the dogs in the neighborhood. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Welcome everyone, it's George the Antique Nomad, and I have been taking a little bit of time off it's been more of a working vacation because in this business, there's always so much more to do. And one of the things I needed to do was to start getting organized for the show I'm doing next weekend in Allegan, Michigan. That is a one-day show. It's going to be Sunday only. It's in the Grand Rapids area. I'm really looking forward to meeting some of the folks there who've wanted me to come to that area and do something. So this will be my opportunity to see some of you for the first time. And... Because it's a one-day show, the chances are I'm going to be really busy and not get to film very much, so I wanted to do a little haul video because I have been accumulating merchandise over the past few weeks because when you're in this business, well, it just happens. I had a friend who needed to get things out of her storage unit. I had a client in Washington who had things that his grandmother, who was an antique dealer, wanted to have sold, and I have also well, been to a flea market because, you know, that is a working man's vacation in my case. So let's take a look at some of the stuff I've gotten. It's kind of a hodgepodge of things, and it's not all my usual stuff. So let's go through it a little at a time so that you can get a feel for some of the stuff that I've been finding and why I decided it was something I thought I could sell. And we'll start with this lovely picture of Lake Louise here. This is by W.M. Thompson. Thompson prints are usually well marked on the right hand side in the lower margin. The colors and the style are very similar to Fox and Parrish, but Thompson mainly did nature scenes, and Lake Louise is probably his most famous. Seeing this picture actually made me want to go to Lake Louise, and I finally did, and it is magnificent in person, even better than this shows. Thompson prints, done in the 20s and 30s, typically sell oh, for. $40 to $50 on average, so I was happy to see that. Below it I have a newer print here. This one is a limited edition for the new Bush Stadium when this opened, I think about 15 years ago, and it's got the pencil signature. I figured somebody who's a Cardinals fan would probably really enjoy that. I got some comic books. I've saved one really cool one that I'm going to put on my level 2 video coming up for the level 2 members who get early access, and eventually everyone will get to see it. But there were some other interesting ones too, like this Battlestar Galactica. That's going to be from about 1980 when the TV series was out. Also, Marvel Universe number 4 is a fairly low number. These are probably worth about... Oh, eight to twelve dollars each. And we've got some sterling in a box. I got quite a bit of sterling, so I'll show you that a little bit later. Also, there was this. This is a Masonic mechanical pencil, and this one is a floater. So when you turn it this way, it says the Grand Lodge of Kentucky, Lloyd Green, Grand Master, 1960 to 61. So we know right when this came from. Then you roll it back, and there is the Masonic logo. So that's kind of a neat thing, and I only paid a dollar or two for that. I find that Masonic and fraternal stuff does sell these days. Now, my friend in Florida is a real Disney fan, and a real Monopoly fan. And he went a little crazy with Monopoly. He had something like 75 sets, so he decided it was time to get rid of a few of them. You'll notice that these are various special editions, and these are worth looking for, especially if they're unused and sealed in the original cellophane. A lot of towns, most cities of any size across the country, in the 1980s, 90s, early 2000s, did a Monopoly version of their own, using local sites and entertainment centers and that sort of thing as the properties. But then NASCAR got in on the act. Official Collector's Edition, Parker Brothers did approve this. 
And of course, they made a deal with Disney because everybody does. And these are the Disney villains in Monopoly. And also in the back, I'll show you here, we've got this 70th anniversary edition of Monopoly. Again, this is about 15 or 20 years ago, but that is a super deluxe thing. These Monopoly boards can sell for anywhere from about $25 to $125, depending on the issue, even though they're not terribly, terribly old. Here's one in the back for Walking Dead. Now that just went off the air in recent memory, but... The trading game, I believe, goes for about $40 or $45. Now, Disney also did the same thing with Clue, and he had this as well. This is the Disney Theme Park Edition. I'm pretty sure that Minnie Mouse did it. She's looking a little too innocent there. I don't trust that. I'm pretty sure she did it in the presidential room with the candlestick, but that's just a guess. Now up on top here in the back is another print, and this is just so lovely. This is Louis Eichart. Eichart is a very famous artist. He worked in the French fashion industry and then became a well-known artist on his own. He just really made beautiful work, and I am very partial to this piece. They typically had lovely women and dogs. It's a printed signature in the right side. This one is 1950s era reprint. He was working earlier than that, 1920s, 30s primarily. His originals go for big, big money, and even his pencil sketches go for a few hundred dollars now. But these nice prints from later times, there were a lot done in the 80s and 90s when there was a big revival of Art Deco design, and I suspect we're going to see a bunch more come out now that Deco is coming back into collecting favor again. But this one, I suspect, is worth somewhere in the $100 range as a decorative item. Now, a different kind of decorative item is this sort of beaten up, worn out looking industrial fan, but it works. And I always want to know that these things work before I buy them, and that's why I paid a whopping $9 for it at an auction just last night. This piece here is a Roseville pattern called Silhouette. I have had a few patterns, uh, pieces of the silhouette pattern recently. This was done in the late 1940s. It's when the floral designs that they had made with the multicolor started to go out of style, and people wanted something a little cleaner and more modernist. And you see the sort of orange color coming in here. Roseville went out of business in 1954, so this line was not made nearly as long as the other floral lines, and I am seeing people getting interested in it again because it fits modernist interiors. I think that that planter is probably a $45 piece. Next to it, the black cat. I will show you what I paid. I paid $6. There is a little oval on the back that I hope you can see. It is Fenton, and it has the number 8. Fenton started the oval mark in the 70s. In the 1980s, they put an 8 under it. In the 90s, a 9. And right before they went out of business in the first decade of the 20, uh, 21st century, they put a 0. So you can date Fenton pretty easily when it's marked. The cat is black amethyst. It's just cute. People love cats. That should be about a $20 piece, so I was glad to get it for 6 Matchbooks are things that typically sell for two, three, four dollars. I think I paid a dollar for both of these, but the reason I got them, they're the older ones, the strikers on the front. That was true until the 60s when they put them on the back for safety reasons. Reno Palace Club, Nevada's oldest club since 1888 with air conditioning and a very good Western graphic. This is from about 1950. I look for defunct casino things because people collect defunct casino things. And they collect beer items, so this is Acme Beer, an ale from Los Angeles, California. Whenever I hear Acme, I think of the company in Looney Tunes, and I always think, uh-oh, inferior product. <laughs> At least they never worked for Wiley Coyote. I'm sure that there should have been a recall. In the antique dealer's estate were a couple of these Russian lacquer boxes in really little script right here where my thumb is pointing, is the name of the town where this was made. There's a few towns in the Palek region that do this sort of work, and there's an artist initial on the right. All things being equal, these boxes are better if they have those attributes. 
A lot of these were sold in the 1970s and 80s during the time of detente. You'll see them marked Made in USSR a lot of times. I got a nice collection of them. Here's another one. This one actually has the artist's name, the town it was made, and a description of the scene. These are all based on Russian fairy tales. They're really beautifully done. They seem to sell typically for $40 to $50 a piece for that size. So I was excited to see those. This piece here, this little strawberry jar. Now this is something that almost everybody is going to encounter. If you're out there thrifting, you're probably going to see this in a thrift store. If you are a collector, you might have one if you're a kitchen collector or be looking for one. Sometimes when things are common, it's because they were really popular and they still are. Now this is very dirty. I paid a whole dollar at a flea market, so I've got some cleaning to do. But I am trying to take a vacation the rest of this weekend, so I'm going to do that later. So you get to see it farm fresh with all the filth. I usually sell these for 6 to 8 to $10, depending on where I'm selling. If I'm in Florida during strawberry season, it's 10 If I'm somewhere where they don't grow strawberries, well, then it's a little less. Now, I mentioned sterling. I did come into some nice sterling. I really like this candelabra with the three light. That's how you describe them. It's a three light because it holds three candles. This is Gorham, and these were actually made to be convertible. So this unscrews. This part unscrews. You could actually turn it into a shorter candle and put another candle in this as a low candlestick holder. They're basically modular, so you can make them as big and fancy as you want. You could even hang arms off of them, and Cambridge Glass used to make little glass inserts so you could have bud vases with flowers hanging off of them. They can be quite an elaborate sort of a deal. And this is a nice pattern that's strong and is very visible with the flowers because they do them as cartouches rather than an all-over pattern. I thought that was very pretty. And because it's a good chunk of sterling, it's worth a few hundred dollars just for the metal value. Other sterling pieces, I did get more than I have out to show you, but I wanted to show these in particular. These are grapefruit spoons. And they're grapefruit spoons because they have this pointed edge to puncture the rind and then the sort of slotting, not open slotting, more of a reading in there to help you cut into the meat of the fruit without spraying everything all over the place. I see there's one stray in there, so we'll have to take that out because that doesn't go with the set. That's one nice thing about getting piles of sterling together is a lot of times there's extra things that you can sell that are not part of the set you bought. And silver, I believe, is at about $23 an ounce right now. It's down from some of the heights it's been at, but, you know, silver and gold, they go up, they go down. Buy it because you like it, and it's a store of value, and over the long run, it tends to appreciate. These are butter paddles. That's what these are referred to back then. Not butter knives. A butter knife is a big thing that is the master knife, and then you would put the butter in the butter pat, and use your little butter paddle to spread it. And these are monogrammed with the date 1899, which is the year that my great-grandmother was born. She was born on December 31st, 1899, and we would all joke that she was from another century, and she hated that. This is a lovely little piece from about 1910. It's a little poppy. It's meant to be some sort of a pin dish. I don't know that it really had any specific function. It does not have a maker mark on it either, but it is sterling. It does have a little monogram. It was presented to someone. This would have just been a pretty piece to have on the table because, you know, not everything has to have a function. You can invent one, but isn't it nice to just have things because they're lovely to look at? And delightful to hold, as the song said. Okay, this guy is a bugle. Is it a functional bugle? Well, let's see if I can make it function. We will try real quickly here. Mm, let's try again. Of course, I did it when the camera wasn't on. Hang on. <laughs> well, that should bring all the dogs in the neighborhood. Ha! 
Well, I just can't seem to do this right now. I tried it beforehand because I was going to impress you all with my virtuosity, but that's just not going to happen, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> it does work, though. And it was all of $2. And $2 for something like that, somebody else can play it. And it's also just a cool thing to set on a shelf or put with a Militaria collection. They always sell. I should get 20 to 25 for that pretty quickly. In the back here, there is a good Kodak camera. This is one of the Art Deco designs. It's a little bit worn, but it does seem to work. In the worn condition, it should sell the 100 and a quarter to 150. Look for Art Deco designs in cameras. And then pulling out from there, you see it's in a box with an Andis vibrator. You can tell from the color of aluminum green that that's going to be, oh, 1940s. And the box graphics are definitely Art Deco, too. You can see in the lettering. The thing that is interesting to me about these is that it's complete and it works. And people do buy them. And you think, well, why would somebody want that old thing? Well... I did an appraisal for a gal once in Washington State who had assembled a museum with 9,000 items related to massage and massage therapy. And the reason she did it is because she had started working in a rural place in California and had a terrible time getting a license because the opinion of that district was that massage parlors were essentially fronts for prostitution. And she said, no, I am a massage therapist. So she went to great lengths for the next 20 years. She and her husband collected all these things to show the legitimacy of massage therapy. Now this is a riding crop. It looks like it's shaped like a golf club, but I think that's just because it was a convenient handle. I like the exotic wood. This would probably be for dressage or English riding from what I've seen. And the price on this was only $12, and I thought, well, certainly it's worth $25 to $30 to somebody who does that sort of sport. And it's also a very pretty thing. It could also just be used in a display if you were a horse person. Now, I bought these really cool lamps, and I showed you the shades in a bag, but I never got them out to where you could see them. The shades actually are the old fiberglass, and they'd sit a little higher, so the lamp will actually look like this. I just don't have any bulbs in them right now. But they are very cute. I like the gold flecking in there. This is going to be from about 1960. The shades alone were worth more than the $25 I gave for the pair of lamps. I think the shades alone could sell for probably $50 for the pair. On the lamps, maybe more like $65 to $75. So I was happy to see those. Always look for these, because having reproductions made of the shades is very expensive. It's more than $65 to have those made these days. If you hear a lot of humming and buzzing, or you see buzzing things like wasps flying into the scene here, it's because I'm kind of out in the country near a lake, and we've had a lot of rain, and it's sunny today, so everything is out chirping. This little favor vase with the flamingo is just a simple tourist item from Florida, probably, although it doesn't have a city name, so it may have just been made for someone to purchase when Fab 50's flamingos were everywhere. I think I paid about $3 for it. I usually get about 12 for those in Florida, 12 to 15 so that should be an easy sell. I also look for Seattle World's Fair and other World's Fair items, and if you are out there, you should definitely look for these because you'll find them all over the country. There were World's Fairs in various places around the world and all over America, the East Coast, the Midwest, the West Coast. These will go back to Seattle. I paid $6 each in Seattle. This, this design's a little harder to find, so I expect these will sell for 12 to 15 each, and they'll sell very quickly. The little lighter here I picked up in Tennessee, and I think I said in the video that I was going to buy it, and I did. I just think it's got a great look with the globe and travel stuff. Now that people are starting to be able to get out a little bit again, the travel things are interesting to people. And then these are flash views for the Lift Jiffy, and as I move around I think you'll see how they flash from... Here we have... A pile of bricks on the ground to, ooh, this thing lifted them into my trailer. Isn't that great? 
Well, there were three on the keychain, and it was a dollar for the three, so I couldn't say no. I like flash view stuff. It came out in the early 60s as a novelty, and a lot of keychains were made with that sort of thing, and people like to collect them. Harmonicas are always a good sell. Honer, I believe, is still the largest harmonica maker in the world. This one had a nice box, although the box does have some separation. It's a little bent. It's a little rusted. Now, you can use fine steel wool to remove a lot of the rust if it's not deeply corroded. Just be careful. Apply a little moisture and do it in an inconspicuous area to make sure you're not taking the plating off. But this should clean up pretty well. And this I can play for you a little. Isn't that nice? Much better than that bugle attempt. Anyhow, I think I paid five for that. It should sell for 18 to 20, even in that condition. Paramedic badge I got when I got the lighter, but I don't think I showed it off, so there we go. People love old badges. Anything to do with paramedics, firefighters, those are professions that still get a lot of respect, and so people look for those sorts of things to collect. Speaking of respect, a lot of people had different feelings about Douglas MacArthur when he was fired by Harry Truman during the Korean War. This is a set that I believe was made by Treasure Craft. I do not show this one in the book, but it's MacArthur's hat and pipe from about 1950 when he was a very popular figure and the Korean War was seeming to go very well. Things turned quickly. Truman fired him for insubordination. He had a big ticker tape parade down the middle of Manhattan, and that was the end of that. This little guy, I think he was 50 whole cents, but he's not Ready Kilowatt. He's Danny Thunderbolt, which was a sort of knockoff, but Danny Thunderbolt originally held things relating to plumbing specialties. Little washers, I suspect, were in here originally. And for 50 cents, I thought it was a good graphic, and somebody would have fun with him. Behind here is a blossom holder, and it's got the Murano label right on it, and it says that it is Nuova Cristalliera Arzances. So it has the maker's name on it, which is nice. These blossom holders were very popular in the 60s in the Murano makers. You see the silver flecking in there. It is hand done. The twist is all done by hand well. This is still molten, so that's not an easy thing to do well, and especially to keep compact. Later makers like Pilgrim Glass in America would just make the flower and then the rest of the piece would go out straight and flat because it was hard to do the curly cues. So this is a nice piece. I got it for $8. I thought that was really cheap for what it was. I really think it's a $35, $45, maybe $50 item. Murano's gone up so much. Some of the pricing I used to know is changing very quickly these days. Things are being discovered. Ronald Reagan is actually harder to find than you might think in political pins. I paid a dollar for that. He should sell for four or five. The yellow bowl here, which was also five dollars, when you lift it up it is McCoy, and it is real McCoy, not fake. So this is a cool thing. It is just a planter, but it's a nice bright yellow, and I am seeing so many decorator sites talking about how pastels are the thing, and then you put bright colored objects in front of the pastel. So if you had a pastel, sort of a creamy yellow gold wall, you would put this in front of it as a pop. And so I thought this was a great thing to buy for that price. McCoy made lots of these kind of low bowls and planters in their prime. Oh, and there's one of our friendly wasps flying around the erector set. I love erector sets. Now, I have to admit, as a child, I wasn't very good at making anything out of the one that I had. And I think that a lot of people my age and younger didn't really play with them all that much. So this is something that is not as valuable as it used to be. But the nice thing is it did have some parts that seemed a little more special, and it had the great graphics inside the lid showing you what you could make, including this outfit here with the silos, and there's the silo in the box. It also has the engine, but the engine would have to be rewired. You can see that the cord is pretty crispy, and when they're cracking and breaking at that point, 
that means a wiring job. So I don't think this is going to be worth a whole lot, maybe $35. More as something to display than anything else. But still a neat piece. Then I've got a bunch of carved wood barware. German figures from the early post-war primarily. You take this out and his neck is a corkscrew. This one with the big mouth is a pourer and his mouth shuts and then you open it and he spits into your glass. Okay, maybe that's not the most wonderful image, but they are cool and bar collectors really like these. They typically sell for 20 to 25 dollars each. The mechanical ones are ones that people really enjoy where you push a lever and things move around. Let me get a better example because that one's kind of old and frozen. This guy with the spectacles, his head pops right up when you do the lever with him. And this one, well, let's see, does his mouth open? It sure doesn't. These sat for a long time. They're going to probably take a little bit of cleaning up to make look good and to make function properly. Now underneath you'll see, and I don't usually get things of this era, but again this was my friend in Florida's, and I'm glad he gave them to me. These are the classic limited editions done by Fisher Price about 25 years ago. You've got the Raggedy Ann and Andy playing the drum. These are 1990s era reproductions and new productions of famous old cartoon characters. We have Popeye here. But these things sell now. They really do. And I'm going to see if I can't take the elephant out of the box here because I haven't really looked at him since I got him. So bear with me just a minute while I try to do that. Yeah, here we go. I think this will come out. This one is a pretty faithful recreation of the one that came out in 1948. But he has plastic wheels. So you, if you saw him in a thrift store... You wouldn't mistake it for a 1948 one because they didn't introduce the plastic pieces and also because they put copyright 1993 Fisher Price on it. So when you see these without the boxes, you'll know if it's a reproduction just by looking it over. But the reproductions are selling for more now than they did when they came out in 1993, which is actually unusual. Most reproductions have gone the opposite direction in the marketplace. So the fact that this is now worth 40 to 45 dollars is a pretty good thing and we will put these out to sell because they are legitimately vintage now and because we're going to represent them properly. Vina, here's another thing and you think, oh brother, George is buying plastic junk. He doesn't do that. This is an antique. Well, this was another thing that was uh, by friends and I looked her up and she's worth some money because she is Star Trek related. Star Trek was sort of a sleeper. When it came out, it didn't even make four years to go into regular syndication. It wasn't until they came out with the cartoon version in the 70s that another generation got interested and then suddenly Star Trek was collectible. Well, they didn't make all that much stuff for merchandising when the first Star Trek was on TV. So these later items are a lot of what people collect because this is what they played with in the 90s, for example, when they were kids. So you have this, the classic Star Trek USS Enterprise. I believe that this piece sells for, and it was made as a collector's series. They weren't pretending. I believe that this one and this one with the crew by Playmates from the early 1990s sell somewhere in the hundred dollar range, maybe even a little bit more. So they are legitimately collectible and they are something that a generation that is starting to collect their old toys recognizes. Speaking of things from the 80s and 90s, here is Miss Saigon. This is a Broadway poster, but what's great about this Broadway poster is it's signed by all of the cast. And it shows the theater that it played in, the Broadway Theater at 53rd and Broadway. It's got all of the cast signatures. I suspect that this is in the three-digit range because of that. I haven't looked this one up. I'm very curious to find out about that. Another thing that I have to look into that I believe is also in the three-digit range that my friend had in his collection, even though it's Franklin Mint, and even though a lot of Franklin Mint dolls are not worth very much money. 
This one is an exception because she's Marilyn Monroe. I don't want to take her out of the box, so you'll have to forgive the severed head look of this. But it's got all the original paperwork. Marilyn Monroe in All About Eve. This is when she was Miss Caswell in her white party dress and coat from and All About Eve. Since we're on a glamour subject now, boy was I happy to get these. Not only are they Hollywood Regency, not only are they boudoir items from the 60s, which are very desirable now, but these are the rose pattern, and the rose pattern pieces sell for more than the other patterns that you see in these. It's got a nice jewelry casket. Again, they were trying to look very fancy. This is a style you would have originally seen in the late Victorian era with the big beveled panels. You can tell looking at these that these are 1960s because of the wear, because of the weight. But they are good pieces. A friend of mine sold the tray on eBay, I believe for $85, just for that piece. These boxes I see priced at shows over 100 now. The bottles are popular. The low one is an atomizer. The tall one has a perfume dauber. It's important to check that these are in good condition, and they are. Let's turn it around so you can see the design. They're really beautifully made, and they're rather heavy. We have a brush and mirror set here. There's the lipstick holder. The lipstick holder is probably the least expensive item, and it might be $20 to $25, along with the little tray with the glass insert. And then we also have an alarm clock. Now, there's something I'm going to show you that I learned from watching an episode of a TV show that had nothing to do with antiques and collectibles, but the gal worked in a clock shop, and they showed her turning all of the hands, and they said, why are you turning all the hands? And she said, because it's happy time. Apparently, in the clock selling business, it has long been accepted that you want to set... Let's see if I can do it with one hand. Oh, yes. Okay. You want to set the clock so that the hour hand and the minute hand point to 10 and 2... Oh, the alarm works. That was a surprise. Sounds like a joy buzzer, but I guess that would wake you up. You want to turn the clock hands to 10 and 2 because when they point up, that supposedly makes people feel better, like things are looking up, things are pointing in the right direction. It's considered a positive, so that's why if you're in a clock shop, you will see, generally, if the clock's not running, they will have turned the hands to 10 and 2. Silly custom, perhaps, but I have to say I have adhered to it ever since I heard it. There's a nice box camera here, and this is a very large format one. It's got a patent date of 1908. Patent, oh no, it's not 08, it's patent applied for, but it should date to about 1908. It's a large format. It seems to be in good shape. This would have been for doing larger pictures. It is the simple box camera where you look in and you see the scene. So we're looking at, oh, my knees, I think, at this point. And it does work. I tried all the little levers and buttons. I made sure that the thing clicks so we know it'll take a picture. That should be worth about $30 to $35 in that size. And that came very cheaply, so that was nice. There's a Blue Moon neon sign. Blue Moon is not a very old brand of beer, and so it's not a terribly old piece, but this is an earlier design of theirs that they don't make anymore, and I believe it's worth about $65. The box here with the great shape is Miramar of California from the 60s. The brown on white. It looks like it's going to take off in all directions. License plate Whirlpool Corporation in Evansville, we make it. I'm not sure that's true anymore, but this license plate would have been if you worked at Whirlpool or sold Whirlpool, you'd put this on the front of your car to tell people all about it. So much manufacturing has left Indiana. A lot of those places have not really recovered from that. If you see a Barlow box, open it up and don't just assume it's some new thing. This actually is a little pocket knife, but it is advertising Logan Telephone Co-op, which is a little, little telephone uh, exchange 
when AT&T took over most of the telephone business in the United States, there were a few little areas that were allowed to have their own local provider. And the little local providers are collectible to people who collect telephone-related memorabilia. So that's why I picked that up. And it was only $2. I figure it's probably an $8 or $10 piece. These were a couple of dollars each. I like the idea of helping America. This is 1976 on the bottom here. Peabody Coal is a big mining outfit. I, I, they're still in business, I understand, but they have played out in a lot of places. So a lot of places where Peabody Coal used to be a big employer, they're not there anymore because the fields have gone empty and that's the end of that. So these are going to be collectible as well, particularly in some of the parts of the country where I sell. I think I paid about a dollar and a half each for those. I think it was three dollars for two if I remember right. And then I want to show you other things that if you're in estate sales, you should look for. This sitting on a shelf looks like somebody's boring family pictures. I'm not even going to bother looking at it. But you pull it out and it turns out actually it has a great collection of postcards. Linen era ones. I love these ones with the city name on it. Here's the Owens, Illinois glass block building, which I believe was at the Chicago World's Fair in the 30s. Chicago at night. This was an organized collection. Here's Carlisle Lake, Saskatchewan, a real photo. Real photos are good to look for. Real photos can sometimes show things that are no longer there, and people will pay extra for those. That might be a $5 card rather than a buck or two. Ships are a good thing to collect and a good thing to look for if you are buying and selling postcards. Now, a lot of these are going to be pretty common. There's probably a whole lot of the state normal school, which would have been the teacher's college, now the state universities in most places, and this one's pretty wrinkled, so that's not going to be worth a lot. On the other hand, these are pre-linen. The finish is smooth rather than looking like linen. Linen finishes came out later. So these are earlier cards, and you see earlier cars in them. People will collect for that. So there's a lot of reasons to collect postcards, and sometimes you can get a great deal at an estate sale. If they haven't done their diligence, you'll see something like this on a shelf, and you'll say, oh, how much for the notebook? Oh, the office supplies are all $3 each. And you walk home with a huge collection of postcards, which is, we're going to see a few more here, and then I'm going to go on to this other pile, which is also interesting. Same story. Here's some really cool leather postcards from this collection. I like this guy going through the ride in Kentucky. Leather postcards were popular around 1905 to 1915 in the early heyday when postcards first started to be a really big deal. There's Gasparilla, the big event in Tampa each year, back when Tampa did not have big skyscrapers. I did a video uh, if you look for the thumbnail, it's one of my early videos, and I think the thumbnail says a postcard worth $100, and it talks all about early postcards and how to tell what to look for. One of the things to look for are postmarks. None of these seem to be particularly interesting, nor are the stamps, but once in a while a good stamp or a good postmark, something from a railroad or, again, a town that maybe isn't there anymore, comes across, and those are worth something, too. So fun to get those, and then there's also a whole set in here of Yellowstone National Park. Ah, yes. Do not feed Yogi. Bad things happen when you feed Yogi, because Yogi thinks you look delicious, too. Here's some little miniature postcards. So it's neat to see a whole bunch of different things that all relate to one subject. So that's a neat collection in and of itself. So very happy to get those. This one actually was fairly obvious because it has Yellowstone National Park right on it, so you could tell something was going on. But here's the other thing that you'll sometimes see in houses. Oh, look, it's a big binder full of plastic crap. Well, who cares about that? And they don't notice it and they don't put a price on it. Well, 
Here's an example of why they should, because these are filled with signatures. There's a ton of signatures. This guy was involved with a Pepsi distributorship, and there are just a ton of different things. There's Candace Bergen, and I believe there are three binders full of these. This fellow was involved with the New York Knicks, apparently. A great big aloha from Bette Midler. So you get this really fun view of this guy's interesting life and how he got to meet all of these really cool people. A member of the Miami Dolphins 1972 Super Bowl is somewhere under there. Let's see if he signed it. There's Shelly Winters back when she was thin and svelte. I always liked Shelly Winters. She was a lot of fun. There's Tim Conway. So this is pretty cool. And these are real signatures, most of them. You can look at this and you can see the way that the Sharpie has the dark spots and the light spots that you would expect when someone's signing their name quickly. And then there's some sheets. Here's Douglas Fairbanks Jr. It says somebody rode on an airplane with him from Washington to Florida. There's another one of his. Apparently he had him signed to, and then he didn't give the one to the person he had him sign it to. That's funny. Some people are not as known to me, but maybe to other people. So it's going to be a lot of fun to go through. There's B.B. King. I got to see B.B. King in concert shortly before he died. And, oh, he was amazing. That was so great. So, and there's Johnny Carson. Now, this one is a printed signature. If you look at that through a magnifying glass, you're going to see little dot patterns. So this is an, what they call auto pen, where it's not really signed by the person. So you've got to look closely to make sure that you have a real signature. On the other hand, these are, and this is the Allman Brothers Band. So you've got their signatures. You've got auto racing. This guy from the New York Mets, I believe, is Gary Carter. There's some Pete Rose in here. There's Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac, one of their various incarnations. And then, let's see, here we go, Mick Fleetwood again. Burt Reynolds signed this one. These are a bunch of the people who were in his uh, training place and dinner theater, and there he is. I think those are the two pay years. So this is just a really fun collection. And I think that we're going to have a lot of fun piecing this out and finding people who are interested in these celebrities. There's Wolfman Jack. There's Pete Rose. And I think there's an actual signature of his in there somewhere, because I looked at that earlier. I don't know if Mikhail Gorbachev is signed, but that could certainly be interesting, too. Let's take a look. The fact that it's in here made me wonder. Oh, well, there you go. So, very interesting collection. It's going to be a lot of fun to go through all of this. It's a little different stuff than I get usually, but I thought it would be really fun to show you. And now I am going to take a break for a few more days because this was more work than I really wanted to do this week, but it just, you know, it's got to be done. And I thought, what a good chance to show you that I am still out there and I look forward to seeing you maybe at the Allegan, Michigan show this weekend if you're in the area. Otherwise, at the various social media that I list in the descriptions, and you can also catch me here on YouTube Mondays and Wednesdays at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Time are my premieres. I also have the Antique Nomad Live channel, and I'm still experimenting with that to figure out where we can go live, but we are going to do some fun stuff there too. So if you're not subscribed there, please do. If you're not subscribed here, please do. It does not cost anything to subscribe. I want to emphasize that. It is no charge to subscribe. And if you're interested in memberships, you can click that link in the description. Anyhow, it's so good to see you. I'm George the Antique Nomad, signing off for now. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below. Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video.
Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!